sandwiches, ice cream, coffee and snacks, and many other pleasing treats. Our foods are fresh and tasty, our drinks satisfying and refreshing. They're so good. Welcome to Average Joe's Drive-In. And now, on with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Average Joe's Drive-In. I am your host, and with me this week is my very special guest, Bill McLean, who has over two dozen acting credits, uh, <laughs> you know, writer, producer, he's a a man, he's a Swiss Army knife of talent when it comes to to film. So, Bill, how you doing? I'm doing very well. That's awesome. That's the first time anyone's ever called me a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> hey, you know, hey, it's it's a good description because you you are a man of of uh, many facets when it comes to the when it comes to the film world. You know, I, I was looking over your IM, IMDb stuff and I was. You know, I, I'm familiar with some of your films, and I was looking over some of the other ones, and I was like, oh, he has director credits and writing credits and producer credits and a, a little bit of stunt credits, a little bit of everything. So, yeah, you're, you're a renaissance man when it comes to that sort of thing. That's a, um, that's, that's a pretty, pretty well, pretty well thought out statement. <laughs> that fits. It fits. I just, I end up, it's, it's weird because I love to do lots of things. I like to stay busy. And a lot of times I end up, uh, you know, you, you're on a film set somewhere and something goes sideways. You need to be able to figure it out and, and keep it from going too far sideways. And for some reason, I have that ability, so it tends to – and next thing you know, I start getting credits for stuff, which was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I come from a – you know, I come from more of a music background and playing in bands and stuff for years, and I also used to book in – run these fe- big festivals, you know, you're, you know, 10, 11,000 people and you're, wow. tra- you're trying to, you know, you're trying to wrangle 20 bands at a time. And some people seem to thrive under the chaos of that element. Like that is your, yeah. you get in that zone where it's just like, you need to be here. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing this. Go see this person, blah, blah, blah. And you just keep going back and forth. And some people don't handle that well, and other people, they just kind of get into that rhythm and that zone. So it sounds like you're kind of very similar to <laughs> in that same way on a movie set. Yes, sir. Sometimes I can be right in there, and other times I just surround myself with people like that, and I, and I look good. Yeah, yeah. That's always good. <laughs> that's always an excellent thing to surround yourself with those, with those people that compliment, and you don't have to that you know are trustworthy and you don't have to be like every five seconds, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, I need you to do this. You can start out and say, listen, this is what I need you to do, and they just go do it, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. That's Absolutely. what it works best. So, <laughs> yep. so uh, you know, what got you interested in, in acting? Well, honestly, um, this goes back a ways. In 1990, when I was in the military, um, I was in the, uh, I'm a vet, so I was in during Operation Desert Storm. Um, uh, I ended up in Montana, um, working in the missile silos, the, the nuclear ICBM, the big boys. Oh yeah. The minute, yeah, the minute man threes. And, uh, a buddy of mine comes up and goes, Hey, let's have some fun this weekend. And we went out and rented a video camera. I was all of 20 years old. We took the camera, ran around, and started goofing off and making skits. And because I grew up on Monty Python and, and Benny Hill and, and Carol Burnett, um, you know, Are You Being Served, all kinds, anything PBS, because that's the only channel we got. Oh, I, I spent many hours on the PBS watching like Red Green, Are You Being Served, Black Adder. Yes, uh, yes, uh, all that, all that stuff. You know? That that was my hey. Um, everything on network TV is off and. It's, I have four channels, so. <laughs> there you go. PBS ruled, right? So. Red Dwarf um, was another one I used to love. Exactly. And that, that was back when PBS was just PBS. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I loved it. So we went out and had some fun. We made this goofy movie and then, uh, I forgot about it, came home and, uh, came back to Maine. And when I got back here, got a phone call a little while later, um, asking me to, help out on a film set in return for uh, being able to rent an RV from me because I work at an RV place. So I'm like, yeah, cool, why not? So, you know, that, that happened. Then um, my that same buddy moved back here to Maine because he apparently, you know, he, we hit it off pretty well. 
he got out, came back to Maine for a while. He ended up moving back to Ohio. But while he was here, there was a film in Lewiston called Shadow Glories. Um, uh, uh, Ziad Hamze, Hamze Mystique Films shot it. And it was shot right here in Lewiston. Um, you know, local film, big budget. Not not Hollywood budget, but big for, for indie. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, he goes, hey, let's go down and be extras. I'm like, yeah, okay, that sounds fun. We went down to be extras. This guy comes out of the building. We're four blocks from the door. That's how many, that's how many people are in line. We're, we're four blocks from the door. This dude comes out with this headset and I'm like, Hey, watch this. As soon as he got close enough to notice, I flagged him down and he, he just kind of walks by about, I don't know, a good hundred people walks right up to me and I go, Yeah, you're going to take us in there or not? He's like, Of course I am. He, he took us into the building. <laughs> <laughs> he took us right into the building, walked us through a, a labyrinth. This was an old, the old Bates Mill, and uh, he walked us through. It felt like we were walking for a quarter mile. We finally get into this weird little room in the bottom, and he introduces me to this guy that can't be five feet tall. I mean, he's got to be like four nine, four eleven. Um, and the guy uh, has an accent, and he's like, "You are a referee." And I go, sure, I'll be a referee. He goes, oh, you're a referee. Yeah, I like you. You're a referee. It's the director of the film. Oh, it's nice. Ziad. So uh, he gives me a role. He gives me a speaking role in the film as the referee. Next thing you know, I'm up on the film. And, and my buddy had to cancel. He couldn't be an extra because his boss wouldn't give him time off. And But my very first fo- real film, and I get walk-on role as a, <laughs> as a referee, speaking role. And, and then... Uh, um, one thing led to another. A bunch of his friends called me over the next three years, and before I knew it, I was in five films, and I'm like, maybe I should take this seriously? Obviously, you're doing something right if, you know, those <laughs> people are picking you out and noticing your performance and, and you know, coming after you directly. That That's a, that's that's usually a good sign. Well, that's the beginning, and mostly it's because – in my core, I love to make people laugh or scream or cry or run away terrified. It's just fun to entertain. I love to entertain. And I think that's a – I think what you find a lot of people that are in entertainment, whether it's movies or music or anything like that, at the root core, I think a lot of us were the class clowns or the kids that – Try to make other people laugh or make them feel good or what or whatever you know. You always wanted what you you wanted to be the center of attention sometimes. Or you you know you whether whether you realized it or not, you wanted to be the center of attention. And I think that carries <laughs> and that carries on. And you become a performer when you get older. You know, you figured me out my deep secret. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there. I'd say all day that I hate, you know, performing in front of people, but you put me in front of a bunch of people to do something, <laughs> you know, and and I uh, and I end up being right in my zone, and I don't even realize I'm doing it half the time. Yeah, you pick up the gauntlet and don't look back. Exactly, exactly. So you've worked on, and that's the other thing I noticed, you know, looking down through your credits and stuff. Is you you've worked on a fairly diverse palette of of films? Yes, yeah. I've, um, I try not to get pigeonholed because a lot of actors get pigeonholed into, oh, he can only do horror, or he can only do action, or he can only do comedy. Um, thank you for pointing that out because my resume does speak for itself. I've done a myriad of different genres. Um, I've worked with Hollywood a listers. I've worked with nobodies. I've worked on big budget. I've worked on little stuff. Um, I just love, I just love doing it. Yeah. And that, and that, that's, I think that's also an important, important thing is to, uh, you've got to enjoy what you do when you're doing any, anything creating. Otherwise it turns into one of those, oh, God damn it. I got to go and perform today. <sighs> you <know>? uh. <laughs> when you can, you know, maintain that level of enthusiasm. I mean, we all go through those. I think anybody who, who does creative anything at some point or the other goes through those doldrums where you're like, man, I, I don't know if I really want to do this or I need a break or, you know. I certainly get bored quick, but I can tell you right now, I'll never stop. Well, at the end of the day, if I'm on a film set at the very end of the day and everybody's gone, I will literally crawl somewhere and collapse. Cause <laughs> I just, I'm nonstop on the set. Absolutely. 110 the whole time. And now, 
you, uh, I can't remember now, when, when I met you at Bangor Fest this year, um, or last year, it's been like two years now, <laughs> I'm trying to yep. say, it's been a while, time goes by way too quick, but, you know, I, uh, I got How to Kill a Zombie from you, now, I'm trying to remember, um, you, I know you, st- you, Starred in it, obviously. <laughs> you were. Yeah. Yep. You also were one of the writers. Yep. Um, did you direct that too, or or? Um... No. Um, my my son came up with the story, and I co-wrote the script with him. Okay. Uh, my wife jumped in, Tiffany, and she jumped in uh, about a week or two in. She noticed we were having fun and wanted to wanted to play. Right. She's like, "Can I pl- can I play?" And the guys are like, "Oh no, no!" But it's uh. <laughs> It worked out because she's got the female side of it, and she actually directed the film. Tiffany McLean uh, directed that film. She also directed Scooter Magruder, which will be out this summer. Um, we finally got it. We finally got the sound cleaned. This film is literally eight or nine years old, um, but we finally got the sound cleaned. She re-edited it. When we finished it originally, we sent it to uh, the uh, an international film festival, and um, we won Best Feature Film, which is crazy. Um, w- with a comedy, um, but people laughed so hard they just we we got the votes. I guess it was pretty awesome. That'll be out this summer. Um, I'm a lot younger in it, uh, but it's a it's a. If you think How to Kill a Zombie was funny, this movie will make you laugh. It'll make you nuts um, during the playing. Uh, it, it ran in theaters for two weeks. Uh, the original cut, and one dude literally stood up in the middle of one of the screenings and went. Just kill yourself. It's not worth it. And he walked out. <laughs> he was so frustrated at what happens to the to the guy that he walked out of the theater. <laughs> and that was awesome. I'm like, yeah. But, but those are those moments that you know become like they live on in infamy because they went exactly that sort of thing ends up making the rounds. Like there was a dude. You know, that's like when you always hear. You know, hearkening back to like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something like that, and they're like people were fading in the theater because they were so yes. disturbed. And you know that film is forty five years old now, I think. Exactly. And that exactly. still, you still, that's one of the first things you usually hear about that film. Yep. Yep. Or crazy. Or stuff. hills. Or was it the hills have eyes? That's. Uh, yeah, same thing. Same same thing. People, you know, you know, people uh, ran screaming. It's like, don't forget to breathe. It's only a movie, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Tiffany. Tiffany's a very talented director. Um, she has, I believe that female directors have a a better, um, what's the word? Eye for, a better eye for detail. Um, than a male a male director. You know, a, a guy can direct, a girl can direct, whatever. But I find that when I watch a film that's directed by a female, there's more attention to detail. And so, I don't know, it just tends to be that way. They pay more attention to the little things, and guys don't. You know, guys like, ah, no big deal. Oh, that, that I, I mean, to, to, be, to be honest, like, every relationship I've ever been in, my, my girlfriends are always way more meticulous about detailed stuff than I am. You know, there you go. Like, Say, yeah. If you're yeah. trying to, you know, you're trying to help around the house or do something or whatever you're happy, you know, trying to do, you know, you're trying to learn something or you're trying to do this. My girlfriends would always point stuff out that I completely yeah. missed every time. Yeah. 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 It's never good enough. You did it wrong. I always, <laughs> right. I always feel like I'm never doing things good enough. But, you know. They're good at that. They're good at that. <laughs> But yeah, um, she's going to be directing one coming up here. Uh, we're we're in pre-production for a fantasy film. It's got elves and dwarves and and uh, orcs, um, magic users and magic creatures. Uh, it's going to be a ton of fun. We're filming it right here in Maine, and it's going to be awesome. See, now Maine Maine is a perfect. Well, that's one good thing. Like I was discussing this with a, another friend of mine about. Maine is really a great state to film in, in a lot of ways, in some ways it's not, but, you know, but, um, but location-wise, Maine is a, is a beautiful state to film in, because you do have a very diverse palette of backgrounds to use, and they're all fairly readily available to get to them. Yes, yeah, there's some great stuff here. Uh, so yeah, like I said, we're in pre-production, so we're, if, if, if people are out there listening, we're looking for help on the film. 
from locations. Um, we need some cool forest locations that are easily accessed but look like deep forest. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, we don't want to drive 700 miles into the middle of nowhere. I was going to uh, say, I could take you to some places up past me, but you're, you know, <laughs> I will take you literally out to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you know? There you go. <laughs> you know, we need to have we need to have power. We have a generator now. I've actually got a portable generator, which is awesome. We haven't had that kind of capability in the past. Um, we're going to be doing a crew, so we're going to be looking for an assistant director. We're going to be looking for um, the rest of the crew. We, we have tied up these uh, script soup, so we don't need a script soup, but but uh, everybody else we're going to be looking for, people that have worked on film before, people that are adamant about it, that are excitable about it, and that will finish the project because Freight Train Films does one thing in Maine. When we start a film, we finish it. Right. Uh, that's what we're known for, uh, and that's important. That's something that – that because independent film, I mean, 10,000 people, what's the – a little over 6,000 films are made every year, uh, you know, including the high budget, but we'll say four or 5,000 of those are indies and, you know, like a hundred people finish them. It's, it's ridiculous. If you're going to start the project, see it through because otherwise you're just wasting everybody's time. Oh, exactly. I, and you hear horror stories about that all the time from different directors, actors, anybody, uh, about, yeah, we were three weeks into the shoot and everything shut down because, you know, part of the crew bailed or this happened or this happened. And it just is like, wow. It, it, in a lot of ways, I think it that when people hear those sort of things, it almost freaks them out from trying to do it. You know what I mean? Like some people, I think that instantly is like, man, I don't know if I want to. I want to tackle that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those. That's why when I do pre-production, we do the entire film before we shoot. All the props are ready. All the locations are signed for. Everything's contracted. Then we do the casting call. And when we do the casting call, um, it's up to us to screen out the people that are going to bail. Right. We don't want people. I simply won't hire them. If I look at your resume and I look at your body of work, I can tell in five seconds whether you're going to finish a project or you're going to get drunk on the set and bail. You know, that kind of crap. Right. I will not. I just, I'm, I'm not a jerk, but I cannot tolerate unprofessional people on my film sets. I run my set like Hollywood runs it. I've been on Hollywood sets. I've seen how they run them. I took notes. I know how to do it. That's how my sets are run. We have fun on my film sets, but we get the job done. Oh, and, uh, and, and if, that's that's a key balance. You know, you have to do... You have to do the work to get a quality product out, but you don't want it to be such a uh, – uh, uh, I think of the word, right word here. You don't want it to be so meticulous and unflinching that people are just like, screw this either, you know. Correct. You want to keep everyone entertained and, and in their zone and happy, um, you know, and, and it's easy to do. I, I – I probably sound stupid or big-headed. This is going to tick some people off, but if I don't hire you beforehand, then I know I'm going to have a good project. If you're the kind of person that's going to mess with a set or cause other people uh, tension on the set, I won't hire a diva. I will not hire someone that's constantly looking at their wristwatch. Um, if somebody sneaks through the cracks and gets on my set and does that kind of stuff, I take them aside privately and I go, listen, what you're doing is causing everyone else to have issues. Now, there's, you know, 50 of us here, and you're the only one having an issue, so I'm thinking the other 49 are good, and I can do without you. Um, and I've had to do that a couple of times, but most of the time I don't because I, I'm very careful about screening. If you don't do 100% of your pre-production before you shoot, you're not going to finish that film. You're going to have problems. And the last film I shot, full-length feature film I shot, that was mine, not just helping somebody, uh, like, you know, like co-producing. Yeah was how to how to kill a zombie and we had we had absolutely zero issues on the set we we had one small injury out of 86 stunt scenes and that injury was was workable and the person uh, got through with no major problems it was minor um, but we did everything beforehand and that's it's all about the pre-production if you don't do it 110 percent you you're not going to because you have to have that backup plan and we have that in place, and then we have a third in place. So if you do the pre-production, you don't have any issue, and the film gets finished. And, and that's something that 
I think a lot of younger filmmakers need to need to like hear and understand. I mean, I have I have done very little in the way of acting. I did one short thin film with a buddy of mine that we you know, you know and and but besides that, I you know I had I did some like school plays and things like that, but I never have been on a, a movie set. But I am a film nerd. I love I love movies. Like every aspect fascinates the hell out of me. You know, I'm one of those guys that will get a movie, and the first thing I usually watch, especially if I'm familiar with the film, is all the behind the scenes and all the bonus features, and you know, listening to the director's commentary and just trying to. Yes. Uh, that's the stuff. I love that stuff. Sometimes you know, yes. I'll, I'll spend eight hours watching the bonus stuff before I ever even get to the to the feature film, you know. <laughs> yep, yep. You know yep. me too. I'm a geek too that way. And, and, and it goes back to like, you know, uh, my love of horror movies and um what part of what made me love horror movies was watching wondering how the effects were done and how did they pull that off and that's cool. I mean just how, you know, that's a cool lighted shot. How did they get that shot, you know, where that's coming out of the shadows into the light and it's not all blurry and crappy looking? And the yes. Effects, and the effects look awesome. And, and you know, and that made me seek out books like um, Grand Illusions by Tom Savini and stuff like that, you know, and then looking through it and going, oh, that's how they did the arrow through the throat scene in Friday the 13th, you know? <laughs> yes, yeah, Savini, Savini was the man. You know, so you, you you can look at Rick Baker, Rob Bottin, Greg Nicotero, Tom Savini. You know, those those to me are like the holy grail guys of of, yes. of, of effects. So I oh, and the thing is that was you know especially and you're starting to see it come back to some extent. Like CG is great for a lot of situations, but I I am a practical effect nerd. I love it when people use practical effects when possible. You know, it's just they look better. They look more real. They, they do, and the thing yeah. is, and the thing is, like especially when you go back to the, the you know the main guys in the eighties, and there was more than just them, but those are the four I think of. But you could usually tell whose film it was by the way the effects were done. And okay, Savini, they didn't call him the King of Splatter for nothing. You know, he he was always way gorier and than most everybody else, but. Rick Baker created some of the coolest looking monsters ever, you know, on screen. And you, yes. you look at the thing, or, or uh, American Werewolf in London, or uh, American Werewolf in London might have been Boteen, I can't remember. But, uh, you know, but most of those guys, or Greg Nicotero, which, who was a protege of Savini, you know, you look at all those guys and what especially when you study the stuff a little bit, you start to be able to pick out nuances, just like with directors. You know, a lot of times you can tell this is a John Carpenter film, or this is right. a Spielberg film. There's, yeah, they have a style. Yeah. There's a certain ebb and flow to the way they direct, you know. It's, yep, yep. It's always very interesting. Is that, now, uh, where where you wear many hats often, how how do you go, you know, like, I know you were saying, you know, about having other people around you, but when you're on set and delegating that stuff, how do you keep, you know, your focus on everything and not get overwhelmed? Honestly, um, I, I'll be honest with you and everybody else out there. I completely and totally wing it if I get in over my head. And so far, I haven't I haven't had an issue. <laughs> I bullshit it, until it clicks, you know. <laughs> it's correct. No, it's it's one of those things where, um, and I'm not trying to rephrase the question for you because I, I understand the question, but if I do my job in pre-production correctly, I won't have that issue on the set. So basically I make sure it's not take, it's taken care of before that can happen. Now, if I'm on the set and something comes up, I'm not sure why, but I've always been cool under fire um, can, can I give you an example? Oh, absolutely. Um, I was on a film called Back to the Beyond, and it's a sci-fi film about a haunted house uh, ghost. And um, there were issues with some of the footage we shot the day before on a ferry, and none of the footage was usable. Um, none of it. It was a complete day lost on an indie film, and when you know something like that happens, you can't get back on a ferry because you don't have the money to do it. Right. 
Um, and, and I was only acting in the film. Um, I had one of the, one of the five leads in the film. Um, I was not producing or anything like that. I was just acting. And, um, when, you know, there was a meeting and I overheard everything and I just stood up and I said, excuse me, can I, can I interrupt? And they all stopped and were kind enough to listen. I said, why don't we just go down to the end of the dock in that little boathouse and shoot that entire scene in the boathouse instead of on the boat. And I said, the second unit can go capture the big ships because we needed, we had to have big ships that day. That's the day that's coming through. And the director looked at me and went, that's brilliant. And we did it. And the film was saved, literally. Um, we got to it. We got up the next day and boom, boom. We, we hammered it all out and we stayed on course and we were able to finish the film on time. And it's, it's sometimes it's, it's simple solutions to big problems. And, sometimes well, it, and you know, and it's not that no one else thought of it. It's just I thought of it first because I'm like, boom, boom, boom. I have a, I love puzzles and riddles and, and I think that's part of it. Um, if you give me a riddle or a puzzle, I will, I will figure it out. It may not be in 10 seconds, and it may not be in a day, but I will figure it out. And my, my analytical mind that way, I think that's why I'm able to convert that to film. That's why that day I was able to just stand up and go, hey, let's do this. Um, cause no, everyone else was in, you know, um, you know, full panic or, hey, we're having an issue mode. Um, my brain doesn't go there. I don't get into that panic mode. Right, right. The, um, and I, and I think that's key. I think that's, that, is, you know, as I said, you know, I think that's a key element to being able to to make things smooth. Because one, I think, you know, even though you weren't, you know, a director or a producer on that, it, but it was coming from someone. But one, you had the confidence enough to go mention that to a director where I think maybe a lot of actors would feel like they're stepping on toes or don't exactly, you know, exactly. don't want to cause, a, yeah, cause just, a big scene or something. Right, and and what I just told you all, it's I haven't really told anyone that before, and and I, it wasn't to slight the people, they simply just had one of those crises on set, which happens, you know, it wasn't anybody's fault, it just happens. I was just lucky enough to keep that keep that in mind, and boom, the, the idea came to me. And, and I think that's that's a, a good thing if you can surround yourself with people that you work with. That you you have full confidence that if something come up and they had a good idea, that they wouldn't be afraid to come up to you and say, "Hey, you know, I know we're having this problem, but I think I have an idea." You know. Exactly, and and I encourage people to help when they can, but but I make it plain that you know, hey, that's the director. We don't want an actor going up to the director going, "I think we should do it this way in the scene," because that's not the actor's job. The actor's job is to simply bring the character to life, and it's the actor's job to do what the director tells them to do. Right, right, right. <laughs> so it's it's uh, we do love input, but when you're actually on the set as a professional actor, you never do that. So, you know, but if there's an issue, then you know, if there's a problem and everyone sees it, then why not offer some help? Right. But if there's not a problem, you really don't want to create one, well, right. even though you think you know better. Right, you know, because I could see where that would create a lot of tension. Because then the director it does <laughs> it's, yeah. unnecessary things. because then for the rest of the for the rest of the shoot that actor thinks they're in control of stuff you know and it's you can't have well, that it, not that you know it, I would never do that and I don't expect someone else to do it and I could definitely see especially if you are on you know you are on a schedule where okay yes. we have X amount of days to shoot this or you know yep. or whatever and you can't. You know, if you do the pre-planning, like you said, going and prepared, and you know what you're going to do, it, you've got this all timed out. Okay, we have an hour and a half at this location. We have an hour and a half at this location. Uh, we have boom, 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 boom. We need to get in and get out. You can't be there for yes. an hour and then have somebody be like, well, what if we do this? And I can, right, I can exactly. blah, blah, blah. that's going to exactly. throw your whole shooting schedule off, you know? Exactly. You are dead on there, Tom. So I, yeah. You know, and this comes from not so much me being on a film set, but like I said, you know, working on these festivals and stuff where I have 20-something bands, and I have to get you guys on and off and have you set up while this band is playing, because if you don't yep. get on and off in this 15-minute time window, we're going to have to start cutting time off your set in order to make everything else fit in. And, you know, something that was always 
told to me, you know, running shows is, your shows always run so smooth. They were like, you know, we usually, you know, I would have the audio engineers tell me, like, everything was, we were actually five minutes early finishing up. You know, they were like, that never happens. Usually we're 40 minutes over. <laughs> we're, you know, but it's just planning out and knowing how things are going to go and conveying to everybody ahead of time, not, you know, not even in a dickish manner, but just saying, listen, we have this amount of time to shoot. We need to get X done here, X done there, X done there, in order to get all the shots we need for today. You know, we have this amount of time. Yeah, you know, you know. Yeah, you know, Tom, what what you're saying, what you're describing to me, um, I don't know if anyone's told you this before, but you have the makings of a great assistant director, maybe a director, because that's what the ADs do. And assistant director, they're the ones that do exactly what you just said to do without having to be a dick, but they can be a dick if they need to. Yeah, you can. Uh, and I'm, I'm, but yeah, I'm you, a, I'm you, a, you ought to try that sometime. I will. Uh, I'm I'm actually planning on I'm actually just getting into the storyboarding phase of something. Um, I, I've had I you know I've written a few short screenplays and stuff. I've never done anything with them, but I reworked one and because I, I wrote a lot of these years ago before I really had started writing again, and um, so. I, I had these screenplays kicking around, so although you know a few months back I started going through all of them, and I was like, man, there's some really good ideas in these, but they need to be re- reworked a little bit. Um, there's yes. things, yeah. There's things, you know, whether it was the way the dialogue was presented, or yes, you know, the way I was describing the scenes, or I was like, man, you know, that's not fleshed out enough, or that's fleshed out too much, or yeah. you know, it's fine that happy medium balance because it's definitely screenplay writing and uh, you know, novel writing, story writing are kind of two separate beasts, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, oh, and I'm sorry, I, ha- I actually had an idea. Can I go back to something? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't mean to, uh, but remember we were talking about, uh, you know, actors saying, hey, what if we try this and what if we try this? If you have, if you're a young filmmaker and you're learning, if you, during pre-production, have a couple of three read-throughs of the script with the actual cast before you start filming, yeah. it gives them, it gives them a lot of ammunition as to what they can do with their character, and that way when we do get on the set, they may not have that idea just pop into the head because they've already thought about it three times. You know, it it just makes it smoother. If you do it in pre-pro, have a few read-throughs with the cast and crew, then then things are much smoother on the set when you actually pull the trigger and do it. And I'm sorry, I just oh, wanted no, to... Oh, no, no, th- you know, that, that's, that's perfectly <laughs> fine. Uh, you know, and also, you know, while we're, we're on that, you know, uh, doing the table read thing is... If an actor has, you know, maybe a suggestion or an idea about a character, if they wanted to make the suggestion, I think that would be the place to do it, not in the middle of the set anyway. Excellent, and you're you're exactly correct. That's what I was going to get to. That's correct. It gets me back online. And, yes, that's the time to do it. And then if you're on the set, if you're actually on the set, and something just screams for you to do it, um, if you could do it in a scene without – extra movement because you've already blocked it all out, then just try it that way. Um, Because the worst the director will do is go, cut, no, that's not going to match. We have to have close-up, we have to have wide shot, we have close-up, extreme close-up. All those have to match. So you don't really want to try it unless unless it's the same movement and the same, you know, just done with a a different tone maybe. But the best time to do it is after the shots are done and you're to the next, if you had that idea, that's when you very quickly just raise your hand and go, can I ask a quick question? Uh, what if we tried it this way? Uh, because sometimes that could be the difference in shot to make the film or not. Um, and that's the only time on set that you'd ever try and do something like that. It's after everything's been shot and cleared and we're heading on to the next thing. Because then you've got a little bit of extra time should that idea come up. Yeah. Oh, exactly, exactly. Again, that's that's the whole planning everything out in advance and not just winging it type thing, you know. Yes, I th- exactly. You know, and I think there's a time and place for winging stuff, but I think that's that more like, you know, when you're starting out and you're goofing off with your friends just trying to make something and learn how to do things more so than, you know, if you're actually, yes, yes. you know, yeah. doing like a professional shoot where you're trying to do all that stuff. 
Because I know that's one of the things that I've been thinking of because I was talking about, you know, um, my, I had some short screenplays and stuff that I had worked on, is I've already started to think about, you know, I want to, I'm going to storyboard out everything beforehand just so I have a rough idea of, you know, how I want shots and placements and, you know, things like that. And then it will go, you know, then I think I'll go to my figuring out my location scouting and that sort of thing and then securing the people that are going to work with me on it and then get the actors. And, you know, and it's going to be like, I know I'm only going to have a real short amount of time to do it because it's not a very long, you know, it's not going to be a very long project. So I'm trying to make sure I don't waste anybody's time and that we can get all this done in the couple days that I, you know, I'm going to have to shoot. Exactly. That's, that's, man, that's pre-production. Get it done beforehand. That way, when you do shoot, you don't have any unexpected things. And if you do, you have, you have that plan. You have that backup. You're good to go. Oh, oh, exactly. Exactly. That's, uh, uh, again, you know, like you said, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an important, an important thing to have. Um, now, where um, where can people find some of the stuff you've been in? I know some of it's available. I I found some of um, some of your films are on Voodoo. Um, there you go. Awesome. Thanks for looking. <laughs> well, I, I happened to come across yes. them because I'd already seen them anyway. But I I happened to come across yeah. them. I was looking for something else. I was like, holy shit! Yeah. That's, I, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's always cool to see some for me anyway because I, I'm a Mainer man. I was born and raised here in Poland, Maine. And do you know how cool it is to walk into a store and see your film on the shelf? That's insane. It's like, look, there I am on the shelf. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I, I love it when I. See... Oh, go ahead. I love it when I see other folks that I know getting places. Like you said, we're on Hulu, we're on um, Amazon, Amazon Prime, we're on Comcast, we're on Google Play, we're on YouTube Play. Uh, over twenty platforms. I can't memorize them all, but there's there's the bigger ones. Um, if you go to um, uh, Amazon Prime, you can find stuff. I mean, I was in a film called You Can't Kill Stephen King. Uh, that film has gone, you know, it's it's been uh, uh, distributed, so that's out there. It's an actual DVD you can buy and see me in. Uh, uh, How I to Kill have, and I have, and I have seen that. <laughs> there you go. I saw um, that. I played a creepy gas attendant. Yeah, well, I saw it after How to Kill a Zombie, and I was like, Wait a second, that's Bill from How to Kill a Zombie. I was like, I was <laughs> like, you, you know, yeah. and uh, I didn't even realize you were in it when I watched it. I just was like, I'm obsessed with Stephen King. So I was like, you know, hey. Yeah. <laughs> and I like the that whole. That was fun to be in. Yeah, I like the whole premise behind it. So I was like, that's kind of cool. There you really, go. You know, yeah. so, I, so I checked. There's, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's out there on the shelves. How to Kill a Zombie is out there on the shelves. Um, I've been in some other stuff. Uh, Edge of Darkness starring Mel Gibson and Ray Winston. The trouble is I was uh, an actor, uh, according to the, the credits. I was photo double, stunt double for Ray Winston, you know. You know, Ray, he's the guy that talks like this. He's in all the films. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was a ton of fun. I, I spent six and a half days on the set with Ray right next to me and Mel Gibson right next to me. Um, that was the coolest thing I've ever done. And those guys were awesome to work with. Super nice, super helpful, super professional. Um, both those guys were incredibly grateful and, uh, humble to even the, you know, the grits picking stuff up and setting stuff down. Um, it was lovely to be there because that's what I do on my sets to every single person, extra or not. And they, those two megastars were doing the exact same thing. And that's, that, that's an awesome thing to hear because it sets, sets a good tone, you know, for everybody around, everybody that's working. It does. Around. Now, you know, the director, uh, Martin, Martin Campbell, he's just flat out dick. I mean, that guy's <laughs> a jerk start to finish and he was a dick to everyone. And, you know, he'd make a point to call out Mel and make him look like a two year old idiot for five minutes. Hold the whole thing up for, you know, it's a mountain of people, it's an army of people. Five minutes of him going off on Mel because Mel stepped sideways a little too far in a shot. It was crazy. Yeah. But, so I made sure, not, I made sure not to make any mistakes where that guy was around. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's anal retentive and then there's that. That's, you know, that's, oh my that's God. Overboard. The guy's a psychopath. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, he's, he's, he's Martin Campbell. He's, 
the new James Bond. You know, he's he's the guy that did all the new Bond movies. Uh, you know, Casino Royale, that Martin Campbell. Um, and I'll tell you what, when he decides to go off on you, I don't care who you are. He's going to go off on you. Yeah, he, and the fact that he's six foot two, you know, he, he's, he's actually intimidating. So, yeah. so uh, it's one of those things. But, you know, be prepared. Be prepared. I never ticked him off, thank God, and Ray never did. But well, a bunch of other people did. And he, he, he'd stop a million, I know, $120 million thing for five minutes to tell you how stupid you are instead of just saying cut and redoing the scene. You know? Oh, oh, exactly. Um, you know, but that, that something else going back to that is working with actors like that is that's going to be just, just, I mean, just being in that close of proximity, observing what they're doing, that alone has to be so. Oh, holy crap. A man. wealth of knowledge yeah. that you're gaining. You know? it, oh, let me tell you what. Every single time I work on a film, whether it's a backwards independent nothing or a high end, you know, Hollywood. I watch all the other actors, and I'll lock on to two or three usually and watch what they're doing and learn from them because you are correct. There is a huge wealth of knowledge there. It's free for the taking. You're already there. Watch what they do and learn from it. I'll take notes, um, you know, just acting notes, tips, things like that, because you never know when that's going to come up in another film that you can use and make it your own. Um, and, and the coolest thing about it, I'm standing there, and Mel Gibson puts his arm around me, and lets me take a selfie that I send to my daughter, and my daughter's favorite actor of all time is Mel Gibson. And when she sees this on her phone, she goes absolutely batshit nuts crazy. She can't believe her dad is on the set with Mel Gibson and getting getting selfies. Yeah. You know, it's it's crazy, but because I'm just a regular guy, but he treated everyone like regular people. So did Ray. But there were people on the set that I would never talk to or look at or work with again. You know, because it just I don't know why you got to be a jerk, but they get to each their own, I guess. And, and that's, you know, and you hear stories like that, and then, you know, like I said, I'm I'm just kind of a film nerd, and I, I love watching all the behind-the-scenes stuff. What I always love is when you hear about those directors where their film sets are like a big family atmosphere. You know, they work with the same people over and over, and they treat everybody with respect, and, you know, when they need to, when they need to get a point across, they get their point across. But at the same time, <laughs> they treat people with an equal amount of respect on set, and they have such like a. And you hear about actors and, and effects guys and stunt guys and everybody talking about, oh, you know, I absolutely loved working with John Carpenter. The man is a dream to work with. You know, he's very, you, go. you know, he's very particular about what he wants. But at the same time, he treats everybody with respect, and you know. Oh, right. Yep. I just you have to. I. It's and that's that's a fact, Chief. You have to treat everyone with respect. That way, they feel like they belong there. They feel like they want to be there, um, and they'll help spread the word on that project. They'll make that project twice as big. Oh yeah, yeah. Because they're they, and I think people, when when. Again, going back to anything entertainment related, when when you have that sort of family, I, I always say the family atmosphere, whether it's music or movies or anything, everybody, I think, uh, tries a little harder to make it succeed and be better because they have more of an emotional investment in it. It's not just a paycheck, you know, type thing or a credit exactly. or whatever. Exactly. You know? They feel... You know, they feel like, if you can make them feel like family and, and be, I'm, I don't just do it. I, I make them feel like family because I'm honest about it. I'm earnest and sincere. When I hire you, it's because I like you and I think you can help the project. Um, so you really are family and you're right. A film, when people are filming, that last day of film, that last cut, that last time, it's like everyone collectively sighs and they get sad. I've seen people cry because they don't want to leave. The family's over. Well, you know, until the premiere, and then it's all cool again. But yeah, you're no, you're right. There's there's a there's a huge there's a huge feeling of belonging and family and and love. Uh, it's it's amazing. When, when I was one of the coolest things that happened to me on that set uh, uh, of Edge of Darkness was I'm sitting in the I'm sitting in the makeup chair. The makeup person is looking at me, just going. Ah, ah, ah. She just kept doing it. I'm like. Lady, just tell me what the issue is. Mel Gibson's sitting right next to me with his his makeup being put on, and uh, he finally goes, "Can't you just tell him what the problem is?" And she goes, 
his hair's just too long because they have to make me look like Ray. They have to make me look like Ray Winston, and and I at the time was in my four, you know, early, uh, yeah, early forties, and Ray was fifty five. Um, so they had to make me look older, grayer, and fatter. Um, and that's just that's just the way it was. So I spent two hours in the makeup chair, and so did so did Mel. He had spent two hours making him look younger because he kind of looked like a bus running motor, you know, when he first came in. I thought it was his dad when he walked in. Like, hey, it's Mel Gibson's dad. Glad I didn't say it out loud because <laughs> right, <laughs> right, <was> yeah. dad. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and, she, and Mel finally goes, "You spit it out. What's the problem?" But in a nice way, in a joking way. And she goes, his hair's too long. And she goes, I'm going to have to cut his hair. And Mel looks her right at me. He grabs my hand. He pulls it over, and I look at him. And he goes, you're not going to let her cut her hair, are you? And I'm like, you know, no, I'm not going to let her cut, her, cut my hair. I'm going to let you cut my hair. And he goes, really? And he jumps up out of the chair, grabs her scissors, grabs my ponytail, and just about, just, just as he's about to sniff, she goes, I don't know, Laura. He moves his hand down, and he hits. She goes, there, and he cuts the ponytail off, and he, he holds it up in the mirror, and he's like, dude, look, and he shoves it in my face, and he hands it to her. That was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Not a lot of people probably can say they've had their hair cut by Mel Gibson, so, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you what, exactly. I mean, I'm, I might be the only one ever. I don't know. But but he could see that I was having fun, and he could see, and I could see, you know, he loves to have fun on the set. I think that that gave him a charge that day. He was he was bouncing off the walls the rest of the day after that. So, I mean, you know, hey, did my part, right? We're good. <laughs> and I, I you know, it, you hear you, you hear about stuff like that. I was watching, uh, I, I just got um, Escape from New York, which is one of my favorite Carpenter films, but I yes. just got the Blu-ray of it. <laughs> just got the Blu-ray of it. I was watching the behind-the-scenes stuff, and they had an interview with the set photographer. And showing some of the photos. Now, there was a thing when any time anybody screws up, they would all cover their eyes and put their hand over their crotch, you know, instead of anybody getting mad or saying anything. That was just their signal for things are going sour, you know. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, they were showing awesome. some pictures like they were showing some pictures like that, and you could tell, like, the whole time she's talking about it, she's trying not to laugh. You know, this, this lady worked yeah. with, Carpenter, I mean, on a ton of films like Halloween and Escape from New York, the thing, yep. all these different, you know, all these different movies, and that was like a common thread, you know, that they they always did the eye, you know, hit one hand over the eyes, the other hand over the crotch, you know, things are going bad, exactly. the ship is going down, you know, kind of. <laughs> But having fun with it, but having, having fun, fun with it. it, right? You know, and I I think having yep. stuff like that always. Those little moments of lightheartedness help keep things from getting. Because let's face it, anytime you're doing <laughs> a, a, a tight quarters, you know, creative thing, it, it's pretty hard at some point that there's not going to be a little bit of tempers happening or somebody gets frustrated. It, it's bound to happen. Yep. So I think it's having bound to happen. Somebody's somebody's going to pop a cork. Just make sure that that you know it's handled. <laughs> right, right. You know, but having something like that, I think, helps diffuse it quickly, you know, because everybody yeah. can yeah. kind of maybe get a laugh out of it, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Laughter cures everything, man. It really does. It does. So, you know, like I said, time goes by quick. We're 45 minutes in, and <laughs> I wanted to talk, <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit, with, you know, before we wrap things up, um, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about, you know, like what are some of your, you know, favorite films or, or stuff you've seen recently that you really liked? Um, favorite all time would be Jaws. Oh, absolutely. Man um, after my own heart right there. Yeah, that film, I, I've watched it 20, 30 times. I, whenever it's on TV and you're flipping through, you have to stop. You, I, I have to stop and watch the whole film. Um, Robert, um, uh, uh, the German actor there that played the, uh, the ship captain. Robert Shaw, yeah. Yeah, Robert Shaw. He's, um, I mean, he steals that film. Every scene he is, is in, he completely and totally steals the scene. Neither one of those other actors, and they're both great in their own way, could hold a candle to that man. He just, he is the film. And when he tells that story about the ship going down, I can see it happening. I mean, I can, 
and I, you know, I'm ex-military, so maybe that's part of it. But man, I, it sends chills down my spine every time I watch that scene. I watch the whole film just to see that scene. But I love Jaws. Um, um, like you said, uh, Carpenter has some great old stuff. I, I was partial to watching horror movies on PBS late at night when I wasn't supposed to. I'd, I'd sneak downstairs, turn it, turn the TV on, turn it way low, and watch horror films. Uh, so a lot of the horror stuff I grew up on. Um, older stuff, you know, Jaws, Highlander, I think is one of the best films ever made. Uh, it still holds up today, even with the cheesy soundtrack, because the Kurgan is the greatest, greatest villain ever in the history of film. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, you need to watch that film. Oh, I I, I <laughs> um, have seen Highlander many times. I have a VHS copy I picked up not too long ago, actually. Because I still so watch stuff would on you VHS. Agree that, <laughs> so. Right, me too, me too. But would you agree that Kurgan is the man? I mean, he's just the guy. Oh, yeah. it's it, It's been a while. <laughs> if you can, I mean, it, it's been a while since I've seen it. But, yeah, it was. I remember that always being one of the coolest things about that, you know, the coolest things about that. Absolutely. Film. He's not only... He's, He's not only terrifying, but he's cool and he's funny. He's the bad guy that you want to kill, but you kind of just want to slap him. You know, it, it's it's good stuff. Um, those are some of the older films I like. New, new stuff that's come out, um, I don't think very much can touch Lord of the Rings trilogy uh, um, yeah. or The Hobbit. Those were, I mean, because, you know, we're you and I are lifelong fans of that stuff. And to see it so well made on the big screen come alive, uh, and then I know it wasn't the books, but dude, uh, that guy crushed it. I mean, he's, I love the, I love the new Godzilla movie. Uh, oh, the new Godzilla. The last was recent excellent. one. Excellent. I, I exactly. And much. did you, did you hang out and watch the credits? I did not. If you, you've got to watch it again and watch the credits because in the credits, an after credit comes up, kind of like Marvel films. Yeah. And they show some photos. They show some, they show some, fo- uh, footage of in a cave and there's these cave paintings and um do you want me to tell you what's there or should i should i not spoil it for you no you you i I will tell you (laughs) i just i'll tell you one of them i'll tell you one of them okay there are dark charcoal cave paintings that show godzilla and there's one that shows mothra oh nice (laughs) and there's one and there's one that shows king Ghidorah. Yeah. Which means the next film they do is going to have those creatures in it. And That's the... I was... Uh, so get ready, because I think King Ghidorah is coming back and see another Godzilla with it. I was kind of... Uh, lit- and it might be it might be, it might might be, be Godzilla versus Kong, because that's what they're leading up to. Well, Kong Skull Island was phenomenal. I love... I had so much fun with that movie. <laughs> oh, I apologize. I just, yeah, I just put you down the wrong path. Kong Skull Island, in the end credits, that's where that was. Oh, okay. They show Godzilla, King Ghidorah, and Mothra. It was in the Godzilla with uh, Samuel Jackson. Yeah. Um, that's where it is. You watch the credits, you'll see it. And that screams that the next big film they're going to make is probably going to have Kong, Godzilla, and King Ghidorah, and Mothra, and oh, some other I, stuff. I would so love to see, uh, uh, what the hell was the, the original... Um uh, was it Godzilla King of the Monsters or the one that where they're all battling yeah, yeah. each other? It's been so long since I've seen it. Like, I used to, when I was a kid, um, and we first got TBS, TBS used to play the Godzilla movies, like, religiously in the summertime and spring and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I always, I always, you know, I think that's where a lot of my love for, like, monster movies comes from. Even before I was into horror you know, like the monster movie stuff, like King Kong and Godzilla was really kind of what got me. Oh, yeah. You know, you know that got me Creature hooked. from the Black Lagoon. Oh, yeah. Oh, creature, from the creature from the Black Lagoon. And, uh, um, uh, the creature from 20,000 Leagues. All kinds of cool old stuff like that. I am dying to see Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water. <laughs> That's like my most, an- one of my most yeah. anticipated films out, you know, coming out that I'm just... Uh, because I, I love Guillermo del Toro anyway. Pan's Labyrinth is genius, and I love the Hellboy. Oh yeah, Pan's Labyrinth, crazy. Yeah, yeah, you, you know the guy. The guy is a stylistic and visual genius. The way he shoots his films, and the na- the way he he tells the narrative, you know, and how he puts stuff together is just uh. There's something about the way he does a film that just you get mesmerized by his filmmaking. 
because there's such a fantastical yeah. element to his storytelling. Yeah, it's like the first couple of um, M. Night Shyamalan films. They were really good, and then it kind of all went downhill, but... Those first few, man, he really, he really knocked it out of the park. Now, see, I, I, out of, out of his, I, you know, out of the, my, I like a lot of his films, but, um, you know, I don't like The Sixth Sense as much as everybody else. I prefer Unbreakable. <laughs> I prefer Unbreakable and Signs. Unbreakable is better. It is. Unbre- Unbreakable is better. The Sixth Sense was good because it had that, it had that surprise twist ending, but some people see it coming like I did. You know, and, and yeah, I more or less did too uh, early on in the film, um, partially because somebody spoiled it for me before I ever got to see it. But, uh, you know, not may, oh, maybe no. not so directly, but some of the stuff they said, I kind of put two and two together and was like, oh. Uh, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, expecting Unbreakable to be anything like what it was and when I watched it I was just like this is genius you know you're yes. it's not it's a superhero origin story but it's kind yes. of not at the same time you know it's Samuel L. Right, Jackson right. playing Mr. Glass and that whole thing and you know I really enjoyed you know speaking of Mel Gibson I enjoyed the hell out of Signs and a lot of people didn't care for it but I I love Signs. Oh no, I love that movie. Yeah, that was a good film. There there is a scene in Signs that still gives me the friggin' willies every time that I see it and that's the scene where he's looking out the window and the alien is standing on the rooftop. And there's that flat yep. there's that quick flash of light and he sees it and then it's gone. It's just like I watched that, and it's one of those films that it's it's like ingrained in my my uh, head because this was back when I I had just gotten a DVD player, and that was one of the first films I watched on DVD. Uh, <laughs> but it was during yeah. the middle of a blizzard, and I was at my old apartment. I was by myself, and the power was kind of flickering on and off, and it was just one of those miserable, creepy, weird nights, and. Uh, Yep. I threw signs on and watched it. I, I was just like, it gave me the heebie-jeebies. Like, you know, it made the hair on my arm kind of stand up and crawl because there was something about, exactly. you know, there was something about that moment in that film connecting at the right time oh. that it just was like, eh. Exactly <laughs> right. Right? Swing away, swing away. Oh, swing away, exactly. You know, that's the, and that's one thing that I think, I know for me, that's one of the reasons I love film so much is because it, of moments like that, you know, that really they just stay with you forever. When a good movie connects with you, and it sticks with you. Much like a really good yeah. song, you know. It brings you back to a time yep. and a place and a moment and somebody you were with and just different things, you know. Yeah, yeah, um... I just oh oh and I'm sorry uh, it's off the subject but um, you said upcoming films um, we're not just filming that one we're filming two over the next two years the other film project besides End of Ages uh, with the Elves and Dwarves we're going to be shooting a film called Bigfoot Hunting I, you and I you and, uh, and I talked about this actually back like a year or two ago you and I talked yeah, about we've this been, yeah we've been We've been slowly doing pre-pro. We've, we've discovered that a lot of the sets and things are the same on both those films. So we're going to do everything we can to pre-pro for both. We're not going to shoot them both at the same time, but at least we can use some of the same scene areas, you know what I mean, and and, and, and uh, make things easier for when we shoot the second film. So those both need to be cast. Those both need to be crewed. Uh, so we're going to make sure that a lot of Mainers – are involved, and what I would like to get out there to you and everyone that's listening, I now am set up. I'm one of uh, three, I think, maybe maybe four if you count them all, filmmakers in the state of Maine that actually has uh, pretty much guaranteed distribution when we finish a film. I've got six companies that that want my stuff the second it comes due. Um, so we're talking internationally distributed, and uh, you know here in America and abroad. Um, so basically all i got to do is make the film. If there are people out there that have full-length feature films that want to get them distributed, I would I would encourage you to contact me. 
friend me on Facebook, go to www.freighttrainfilms.com and send me an email, you know, send, send me a contact message um, because I know what it takes to get the film to them and I know what it takes to get the film out. Um, and I can help with that because I'm trying to bring Maine film together. I'm trying to bring more film to Maine, trying to get Maine more on the map. Um, and I mean that when I say I will work with you, I will help you. Um, it's it's if we don't work together, we're we're never going to catch up to everybody else. Well, and that's and that's the thing. Like I was, you know, um, Maine is such a big state, but it's a very small community of people who are involved with this sort of thing. So it's one of those where you, I think it's it's important that everybody, like you said, kind of everybody kind of look out for each other and help each other out where they can. And you know, it's it's. Uh, a great quote. There's a there's a podcast that I absolutely love called The Movie Crypt with uh, Adam Green, who directed the Hatchet movies and Frozen. A few. Oh yeah. And uh, Joe Lynch, who just put out a film called Mayhem, um, and he's done a bunch of other stuff. But they were talking, you know, because they have a they have a they have a section where people send in mail and ask them questions. And one of the things the guy was having a really hard time finding it. I think it was a DP and. Uh, as director of photography, for those of you who might not know, um, and he, you know, he was trying to direct a DP, and he was like, I don't know, you know, there's nobody in my town. And, and those guys brought up something great. There's always other people that want to do this sort of thing. It's, it's a uh, matter of finding them and connecting with them and network. Networking is, is such a huge key yeah. thing. You know, Maybe yes, and that's and thanks thanks for letting me bring that up a minute ago because that was the point. Um, the networking is huge, and just to reiterate, I have distribution lined up. If you can get me your film and you can get me the things that need to be done, because there's about 120 things on the list that they demand in order to even screen your film. Right. I have that list of things. I can help you get it out there as long as it's a complete film and you meet those requirements, I can get your film distributed. How many people here in Maine can say that? Basically, I'm looking for people who want to be in film and who have some experience to help me on my next two projects. But it's it's not one of those things where we're just going to do it and never happen. We're going to do it. We're going to get it done. And we are going to get distribution like I already have in place. So if you come work with me at Freight Train Films, you're going to be an internationally distributed person. And, and that, I mean, that's... That's that, you know, it's that window in, of opportunity that doesn't get thrown out there very often. So, you know, it, and I, you know, um, I have listeners all over the world on this show, you know, so this is going to get a good reach. And, right. and you know, it's, it's, right. uh, but it's one of those things, like, I, I do have a lot of main listeners, at least I'm assuming I do. I know a lot of, you know, fairly, fairly, uh, uh, a decent group of people that listen to this, and a, and a lot of them are actors and actresses and people that are involved. There you go. That's what that's that's who I'm looking for. And I'm not I'm not trying to sound big and important because I'm not. I'm a Mainer. I live in Maine. I'm an average everyday guy, and I'll work with anyone. Period. I'm just trying to stay the fact about. I know how to do it. We can do it. Come work with me and give me your best. I'll get you out. Experi- experience is the greatest teacher. You know, it's it, and having that experience that you can kind of pass on that knowledge to other people is huge. You know, that, that's, a, that really is, it's a huge, huge thing. Um, but, but one thing I wanted to bring up real quick that they were talking about, um, was if, you know, if your buddy is shooting a film and he needs a grip or he needs a lighting guy or he needs, uh, you know, an AD or something, but maybe that's not your specialty, but he's having a hard time. Go help him out. That's experience you're going to get doing those. It gives you, yes, it, it is. It gives you a yep. broader spectrum, you know, a bigger palette of skill sets to look at the bigger picture when you're shooting your own. And when you get ready to shoot, correct. they'll return, you know, nine times out of ten unless they're a complete dick or t- scheduling doesn't happen to work <laughs> out, they're going to, you know, they'll return the favor. That's exactly right. And, and what you said is correct. If you can do anything on a film, acting behind the camera, in front of the camera, do it. Because the more experience you get, 
the better you're going to be at it and the more people are going to want to use you. Oh, it, <laughs> that explains my resume, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that, that scatter shot, I'll do whatever it takes on a film set. I don't you know, care. but <laughs> you, look at, you look at some actors, though, you know, and you can include yourself in that. They've made, they have made a pretty viable career out of, out of that sort of thing of willing to do yep. anything and everything on a set to help out and make things happen. And these people have had very long careers and many, 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 many credits. So <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, all right, man. Well, you know, I want to, I got to start wrapping things up here. Um, but sure. I wanted to, I wanted to thank you very much for coming on and, and, uh, you know, hanging out and chatting with me today. Um, I've been, like I said, I, I wanted to have you on for a while. It's just, I, I get, it's weird when I start booking shows because I get them booked so far in advance sometimes that it's like, I, I try yep. not to book too yep. far in advance, but at the same time, I like to be at least six or seven weeks booked ahead at the same time. And it's, you know, all of a sudden. Well, it's very good that you're, I'm sorry, it's very good that you're busy. And I do want to thank you so much for thinking of me and letting me come on the show. I greatly appreciate it. I want to say to everybody out there, thank you. Uh, thank you if you've worked with me, and I'm looking forward to meeting you. If you haven't, um, I'll be here for you. And hopefully sooner or later, maybe you and I can work on a project together in some capacity, and I would, you know, enjoy that. And hopefully sure. that we can make that happen some way, one way or the other, you know, down the road. Does it have to be awesome. today, tomorrow, whatever? But definitely, uh, before I go... As always, I would love to thank my sponsors, the main Cannababes. They are doing a bunch of different um, charity projects coming up. They're also going to be casting for a new calendar. Um, there's all kinds of cool things that they've got going on. You can go to maincannababes.com to find out that information um, and find out how you can become involved with them. I still haven't made my new intro because I'm waiting on some stuff. I, I do have my new... Um, my ad spot will be coming up for the Cannabis. I know I've been saying this for like three weeks, but things happen. It's very hard to collaborate sometimes and get all all the ducks in a row. But I talk about them at the end of every show, so they're still getting mentioned. And they, they know that, and I, you know, I'm going to be working with them pretty soon on that. Um, another thing before I forget, Bill, where can everybody, besides FreightTrainFilms.com, where can people check, you know, find you online if they want to get in touch with you, like on social media? Well, the easiest way is to, yeah, sure, social media. The easiest way is to get me on Facebook. I'm uh, Bill McLean, M-C, capital L-E-A-N, small c, M, small c, capital L-E-A-N. And I'm on Facebook, and in parentheses it says Bill Freight Train McLean. It's a nickname that I don't even remember who gave to me, but it, it stuck and People call me Freight Train now on, on film sets and on social media. But go on Facebook. Feel free to follow me. Feel free to friend me. Uh, if you're interested in being an actor or interested in film in any way, please friend me. I'm, I've got plenty of openings. I keep it. I keep my friend list down to mostly people in the industry, and i still got, oh, I think 2,000 entries. I've got like 2,500 friends now. But um, feel free to hit me up on Facebook. Um, I'm, I'm easy to talk to. And I always respond very quickly if I can. Oh, so, yeah. Sometimes sometimes life gets in the way. You know, life is life sometimes. And it does. So, you know, getting right back to people sometimes is difficult. And I think most people <laughs> understand that. But I'm the same way. I try to respond to everybody that gets a hold of me as quickly as possible. Because I, I don't, I don't want to, yep. you know, make anybody feel like I'm not, <laughs> you know, paying attention or whatever. But um, if you want to check out Average Joe's Drive-In and support the show, you can, by adding us on social media, go, you can add um, on Instagram, Thomas Washburn Jr., on Twitter, TWJ Author, uh, on Facebook, Average Joe's Drive-In Podcast, or you can go to www.thomaswashburnjr.com, where that is my melting pot for my writing, for my uh, anything I'm working on, basically, whether it's the podcast, music, um, probably be, that's where I'm going to have all the links to any of the video stuff I start working on, um, because I really haven't talked about that on the show other than with you today, so <laughs> I'm going to get into that a little in more detail as I get closer, um, about what's, what that whole deal is all about, um, 
And again, thank you for everybody that continues to support the show. My books are available on Amazon.com. Uh, if you purchase a book for Kindle or paperback, that money I basically am putting right back into the show. Um, if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription, you can read the books for free. Uh, you get so many free books a month with Kindle Unlimited or uh, Prime, Amazon Prime. Um, so you can read books for free, and I get paid for them when you do because it goes by number of pages, read. Right? Uh, so does it cost you anything other than your subscription that you already have and I get paid and it helps me out with the show. So thank you everybody for listening to Average Joe's Drive-In. I am your host, TJ Washman. I will see you sexy animals on the flip side. It's intermission. Rise and stretch time. Time to refresh yourself and visit our snack bar. Got a yen for hot popcorn? Your favorite soft drinks are sparkling cold. The juicy Frank sizzling hot. There's delicious coffee, freshly brewed, and all kinds of ice cream and candy to tempt you. Showtime will be announced loud and clear to get you back to your car in time. So stretch your legs. Come to the snack bar now. <laughs>